it's a personal talk in that what, what, I want to, what I want to show you is some of the observations that I've made over the years from the various teams that I've either been a member of and, and been led by someone else and, and those teams where, where I've been its leader. It is a combination of things I've seen done well and things I've done, seen done very badly indeed and I'm going to give you no clue as to which is which and which were done by me. <laughs> of course I can't control that one that way so that's not going to work. Excellent. Right. Bit of introduction to myself. The, the weird signs on the right on these slides would have been my speaker notes if this were being done on my laptop. So just ignore the yellow blobs and I'll try and remember what I was going to say. Uh, so just a little introduction about myself that will allow you to decide whether you want to bother staying to the, for the rest of it. That's a machine that I learned to program on back in 1981, which tells you a little something about how old I might be. Uh, I probably learned everything I needed to know about programming on that machine. I'm not sure I've learned a great deal since, to be perfectly honest. Um, that, if you're old enough to recognise it, was the logo of what was at the time one of the biggest employers in the UK. And I joined ICI in 1990 as a, a young graduate engineer. Back in those days, I was an electrical engineer, so the sort of projects I was running were building high-voltage substations, um, refurbishing power stations, so some, some really sort of heavy-duty stuff. I stayed with them for about 10 years in my career, uh, did all sorts of engineering projects, but gradually moved over to software systems and IT systems, uh, and eventually ended up doing the sort of stuff that I do today. Uh, my final employer, and my current employer, is um, this fine-looking gentleman here. I started working for myself in 2001 um, as, as, a, as a freelance programmer, developer. Basically, if anybody's willing to pay my day rate, I'll probably do it for them, yeah, within reason. And in that time, I've worked for all sorts of organisations, from housing associations to hedge funds to hospitals and, and, and everything in between. But I want to tell you a couple of more things about myself. Firstly, for 15 years, and I've only just recently stopped, I was uh, a manager within the Scout Association. So I wasn't the sort of leader that takes young people out camping. I was one of the managers that those adults report to. Um, and I did various roles in that organisation at various levels of seniority. And the last one that I've just stepped down from uh, I had 1,250 young people uh, that I was responsible for and a team of about 250 adult volunteers. And then more recently, and this is actually the reason I've stepped down from it, this shiny new logo is the logo of the UK Python Association. Now that was formed back in 2017. Uh, and I'm now one of its trustees, and we are gradually taking over the running of PyCon UK and looking to expand the, the sphere of what we do from within that charity as well. And I like that logo so much that I'm going to use it on here for when I don't want you to be looking at the screen. And I don't have any other better slides. But why, why do I want to tell you about the time I spent with Scouts and, and the time I'm going to be spending with the UK Python Association. And this brings me to my first point. I am a firm believer that leadership skills are just like any other skill. They can be learned, they can be de developed, and they can be improved. I've often heard it said that leaders are born, not made. And I fundamentally and absolutely disagree with that statement. These are skills like any other, and they must be practiced in order for them to improve. The reason I took those roles in scouting was because when I started working for myself, I was a little bit nervous that I would be losing the opportunity to do quite so much leadership. And I went and looked for an organisation where I could do so voluntarily because I wanted to continue to develop those skills. And I'm, if that means anything to you, if you're interested, I thoroughly recommend this book. It's, it's very readable. It's written a bit like a novel. This, uh, the, the, the author was a, a world champion uh, table tennis player. Uh, and he slowly realized that if he looked at the top 10 people in the world, um, I can't remember the figures, but a certain number of them came from the same town as him. And when he looked a bit more closely, he realized actually they came within three streets of where he grew up. And it was all to do with the level of coaching that was going on at the school and the club that he was a member of. 
Uh, and his book is all about examples of where he's found exactly the same thing going on. So this is all about the fact that any skill you care to mention can be developed, can be practiced, and can be improved. I thoroughly recommend you go and um, have a read of the book. And my suggestion for anybody that's interested in developing their leadership skills professionally is to find opportunities outside of work to go and try them out. At first, you'll be applying what you learn at work to what you're doing voluntarily, but you'll be amazed at how fast it turns around the other way. In a volunteer organisation, you're probably going to get promoted a lot more quickly, <laughs> and you'll have the chance to be operating at a far more senior level. And I'm going to have to do a sneak peek at what my next slide is, because I haven't got my speaker notes. Right, OK. What we're going to come and talk about next? <laughs> What I want to talk about next, the next point I want to, um, let's say you are new into a leadership role of a team. There's lots of different ways in which that might have happened. You could have been promoted, you could have been voted in, depends on the organisation. But one of the things that I've seen in so many cases is that there is very often somebody or more than one person who doesn't like the fact that you're in charge. Now, it might be because they wanted the role, it might be just that they simply don't like you, they might disagree with the direction you want to take things, it can be all sorts of reasons. But it happens regularly. In fact, my observation is it happens more often than it doesn't. And that resentment is poisonous, and it will kill a project if it's left unchecked. And so as a new leader, for me, it has to be dealt with and dealt with early on. And there are three strategies that I've seen work. Firstly, show them the love. So find whoever this is, flatter them, ask them for help. Find some problem that you tell them, it might be true, it might not, that they are the only person that can fix for you. Find some problem that they have that you can fix for them. But show them the love win them round, get them on your side. Second strategy, pick a fight with them. <laughs> Find something where you know they're going to disagree, pick the fight and win it. Make sure they know you want it, make sure everybody else around them knows you want it. Make them very, very nervous of picking a fight with you ever again. It's a slightly more dangerous strategy because if you lose that fight, you're sunk and you're probably sunk for the term of your leadership. But it can be very effective if you prepare the ground if properly, you pick your fight carefully, and you make damn sure you win it. And the third one is get rid of them. Now, that's more difficult in some organisations than in others. Some cases it's not even viable. But in a lot of cases, it is actually the only way that's going to work. Now, I call these three strategies, schmooze them, bruise them, or lose them. <laughs> but the real point I want to make is most of us will naturally have a tendency to one end or the other. Some people really don't like conflict, and they would want to show them the love. Other people relish the chance of a fight, and that's where they'll go first. The problem there is it can take a long time to deal with this problem if you've picked the wrong strategy to start with. So my advice is think these three through and consider which is actually going to be the most effective, which isn't necessarily the one that you're most comfortable with. Again, I'm going to have to do a sneak peek. Right, here we go. <laughs> Next thing I want to talk about is priorities. How on earth do you go about deciding what your priorities are? Often when you take over a team from somebody else, you'll suddenly get hit with all the things that you didn't know about. You probably walked in knowing some of the things that needed to be solved. You'll find out the rest of them 30 minutes after you take the role on. How do you go about sifting all this through? Well, I obviously can't answer the specifics for your team and, and your problem that you're dealing with today, but what I can do is, over the years, I found that most problems fall into one of those bubbles. And so this little diagram is something that I carry around in a little laminated A5 card in my bag. And I will regularly, daily, scan that diagram. And what I'm asking myself is, do I know what's going on in that bubble? 
do I trust the process by which that information is coming to me? Because if the answer to those two is no, that is immediately a top priority. As a leader, I must know what's going on in each of those bubbles. Because if I don't, there could be problems that I don't even know about. So first and foremost, do I know what's going on? Do I trust the process by which I find out what's going on? And it's only then can I run around there and work out, okay, what are all the problems I've got and how do I deal with them? Now, I can't put them in priority for you, but what I can do is to give you a little tool that I found helps me and one or two others, because I'm not the person that first came up with this, um, to decide how to go about that. Now, one of the questions that often comes up at this point is in the sorts of work that most of us in this room do, I suspect, should we carry on coding if we are the leader of a technical team? Now, you'll have heard me say previously, I'm a great believer in if you don't practice, your skills won't improve. So I'm going to say, well, yes, if you want to continue to be able to code, then you need to practice it, and that means you need to keep on doing it. But if you're the person in charge of a team, when a problem comes along from one of those bubbles, who do you think it is that's going to have to drop everything and deal with it? Well, it's you. So if the code that you're working on is so vital to the delivery of your project, then you're stuck when whatever this problem is hits. And so my advice here is always, if you have the ability to do so, make sure your coding as the leader is something in the corner that can be dropped. It doesn't have to be delivered tomorrow. It isn't vital for the next release. It can be dropped. It can take a back seat and you can come back to it later. Right. I'm trying to rattle through it because I'm conscious we're a bit short of time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about leadership styles. Now, again, this isn't my material. You can look online and you'll find lists that look very similar to this. But what they're trying to say is that there are various ways in which you can go about making decisions in your team. So at the top, you've got dictatorial. That is, you're the leader. You make the decisions. And nobody else even gets a say. And as we come down the list, paternalistic is where... Yeah, you're in charge, you'll listen to what everybody else has got to say, but you're the one that's going to make the decision in the end. Uh, consensual is where you will attempt to seek consensus and get everybody with you, but it's your call and you will make a call if you need to. A democratic is where you have a voice and it's equal to everybody else's. It's, you have no more and no less voice on the team. And then finally, hands off is where you don't even give yourself a vote. So your team makes the decisions, you just oversee the process by which that's done. Now, you'll see things written where they suggest that you should find your leadership style and learn to work with it. Absolute nonsense. Absolute <laughs> utter nonsense. <laughs> Let me try to show you why I might think that. Here's what I think is a far more useful tool. So we've taken those styles and put them on the y-axis. So you've got the dictator at the top and the hands-off observer down the bottom. But let's plot something else. Let's plot the level of expertise. Now, this is a relative measure. This is how expert are you as the leader compared with the people that you are leading? So on the left-hand side, we're saying you are a complete rookie. You know virtually nothing compared to the experts around you. And on the other side, you're the expert. They know virtually nothing, and you are the one that holds all the knowledge. Oh, that's right, it doesn't show up on this screen. So, the sweet spot of where we should be operating in as leaders is somewhere in that green area. The more you know relative to the people around you, the more you should be dictating those decisions. The less you know relative to the people around you, the more you should be handing those decisions off to them. And so, for me, it is not your personal style that you need to find. It is what is appropriate for the team that I'm in. I can't remember which order I was going to do this in, so the slides might go a bit awry here. However, my observation from the sorts of technical work that we do is that even that's not good enough. It's not enough to say, 
what is my level of expertise versus my team? Because actually, I found that this changes day by day, depending on the topic that's being discussed. I've even had examples where this has changed during the course of a conversation with one individual. As we move topic, our relative expertise shifts like the wind. So you might have been able to pick a sweet spot in here on the sorts of projects I was doing as an electrical engineer, and you could live with that sweet spot for the whole duration of the project. Not in the kind of work that we do. You're moving up and down in here, daily, hourly, even within the course of a few minutes. My piece of advice is, if you find that you're doing that, just be very careful hopping from one extreme to the other in one hit. The people around you will likely find that very confusing and they'll wonder what on earth your behavior is and what's driving it. So if you find you do need to shift, try to do it gradually, one, night, one notch at a time. Um, quickly, I want to look at, so what does the behavior that's not in that sweet spot look like? Well, if you're dictating to people who already know what they're doing, I'd call you a git. If we're down in the other corner, you're failing to provide your level of expertise and you're leaving people adrift. So perhaps we could call that subversion. <laughs> very, very quickly, I want to talk about process. I know this slide is a bit wordy, but the copyright says I have to put it up like this. But what I actually want to draw your attention to is the very first thing on that list. And that is the authors of that Agile Manifesto said that they value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And they chose to put that first on the list. And I think they were spot on right. My observation on process, and you as the leader will be in charge of process, is that too many people think they know all about it. They think they're a grand master in some agile technique or other, and all projects should be run in that way. Complete Rubbish. Let's go back to that style and expertise diagram. You're operating here. Unless you know all about Scrum, Extreme Programming, Prince 2, and all the other ones that have existed over the years, and unless you've had experience of being in projects that are using it, you are not an expert on process. And if you're not an expert on process, what are you doing trying to dictate what everybody else does? You're firmly in that left-hand box. You're being a git. Instead, you should be finding what works for you and for your team. By all means, get yourself more educated so that you can steal ideas from these various processes. But I would suggest that very few of us in this room are really expert enough in the business and the process of developing software to be operating anywhere near the top of that y-axis. So, to sum up, uh, Practice makes perfect. Go and find opportunities. Go and look them out. Go and seek them and take them on board. Um, if you find you have to deal with a resentful member of your team, then it's schmooze them, bruise them, or lose them. Choose one carefully. Don't just go with the one that you uh, naturally fit with most easily. Uh, priorities. You've got to deal with the fact that the unexpected will come along and you're the person that will have to pick it up. So don't make yourself so indispensable somewhere else that that is itself a problem. Style, one notch at a time. Be aware of the fact that your behavior will have to change over time, sometimes very rapidly. Try and keep the swings from one extreme to another to a minimum. Move carefully up and down. And process, don't be a git. Uh, thank you very much for coming to listen to me. Uh, it's always very nerve-wracking when you stand up and you've, you've had a talk submitted and accepted and you wonder whether anybody actually wants to bother listening to what you have to say. So it's great to see you all here. Uh, my contact details are there and, and I'm around for the, for the rest of the conference. Please do come and have a chat. And, uh, thank you, Robin. Time. So we have plenty of time for the questions. Okay. Thanks, Owen. That was really interesting. Um, there's a real danger when you're deciding which strategy to use with someone who is the potential problem, as you indicated. <laughs> How does one judge which strategy 
to take because if you make the wrong one, it's going to backfire on you and would uh, leave you in a worse position than before, potentially. Yeah, and that is very definitely the case for each one of those because the danger with getting rid of someone is obviously you've just shipped a load of skills straight out of the door that possibly you didn't even know you were losing. Um, as, I, as I said in the talk, if you pick a fight with someone and lose it, you're in real trouble. And that's very difficult to recover. Um, what's perhaps not so well noticed, we, people often think that what that means is we should always schmooze them. We should always try to show them the love. The danger with that one is that that can just fail to work for a long period of time and that resentment just festers and festers and festers. And in some cases, some people will attempt to spread that poison. They'll recruit allies and, and you've got a bigger and growing problem on your hands and the project will just fail. Um, for me, Getting rid of them out of the door is often driven by whether or not the organisation will allow you to do that. In, in a lot of organisations, that is just so difficult to do that it's not even worth thinking about. Actually, in a lot of cases, you may well have had to have picked a fight with them and recorded every last detail of it before you're even allowed to do that. In other organisations, it's a lot simpler. Um, and so, whether or not to pick the lose them strategy is organisation driven for me. The bruise them strategy really comes down to whether there is a fight that you can very definitely win and be seen to win. And if there isn't, you're stuck with showing them the love, hoping that it works, and possibly kicking them out of the door later on when you've proven to the entire world that it won't. Probably by having three or four fights along the way. Uh, one... Sorry, oh, here, w wonderful talk. I wanted to ask, uh, and I kind of wonder, uh, whether you explain this to the team that you are leading, you know, that then, <laughs> they, then they kind of understand, for example, once you are going from Git to subversion, hopefully not, but you know, on this, on this axis that you are actually flexible within your leadership style. Um, as long as the resentment issue has been dealt with, then yes, absolutely. Uh, I would tend to keep this sort of stuff to myself if I've got that sort of issue to deal with when I first take a team on. Because all too often, if somebody's already got a problem with you, they'll use anything to try and attack you. And by showing that you want to do this sort of stuff, it's almost invariably new and it's different. And there are certain individuals that will just take that and use it as part of their ammunition and just make your life more difficult. So yes, I would. Absolutely, as soon as I can, and that means the resentment, any resentment issues have been dealt with and cleared out of the way. Um, but yes, absolutely. Hi, Owen. Um, I've only been like a leader temporarily in my life, and I always have this problem actually multiple times that you have um, people who are like longer in the company or like just more experienced, and like you have rookies themselves. And sometimes rookies have uh, very flexible uh, attitudes to some rules and so on. But the general pattern for me is not that they dislike you as a leader, but they dislike each other uh, because they have yeah, different attitudes to, I don't know, to code style, for example. Uh, this actually happened to me. And what do you do if they start fighting? Like, uh, and if you don't step in, obviously, soon enough, they, they both hate you as well because you don't do your job, right? So how do you solve the problem of people not hating you but hating each other, right? You don't want to fire both of them, right? <laughs> yes, I've, I've unfortunately dealt with more than one team where there were um, collapses of marriages within the team, let's say, <laughs> for all sorts of reasons. And, um, and yeah, that ca you, you, you eventually become... A, a mediator, a counsellor, and, and I, I can only suggest, and, and it's what I've done myself, is that if that's what you find yourself doing repeatedly, and, and I have done it myself, is you go and learn those counselling skills. Um, and you can do it, and again, you can volunteer to do it, you can read books on the subject, you can go and practice it. Um, but they're vital, and, and you really are acting as a counsellor and a mediator in a, in a fight. Uh, between two people, often nothing to do with the project that you're working on. But actually, even when it is, it doesn't matter because the fight has become more important. Um, but those counselling and mediation and arbitration skills are things that you can read about, you can learn, and you can practice. And my suggestion is to do precisely that. Uh, 
uh, yeah, question. Uh, what's your favorite strategy when the size of a team exceeds what one single person can actually handle? Of course, you can always do the standard way of forming a pyramid, where you just have like three sub-leaders, and once a week you call them in, you smack them for what they've done, <laughs> and then you've basically done, yeah? So it's basic, I think it's the easy path. Uh, but you lose uh, connection to the team, and if you divide your team in sub-departments, then maybe one sub-department will be good because it has a good subhead, and the other ones will just fail, and they lack sharing knowledge and so on. So what's your take on that? I take us back to those leadership styles. It really depends on what my level of expertise is versus the people around me. I've, I've seen it go very, very wrong when a leader has walked in and decided, how we're organizing ourselves, bang, 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 three department heads or three sub-teams or whatever it might be, without bothering to find out first whether the people who were doing the work thought that that was a good idea. And guess what? It wasn't. Failed spectacularly. Um, so it really, you know, but on the other hand, if you've been with that organization for 20 years and you're the person who really knows how this place works, then yeah, put yourself right at the top of that axis and you decide. So it's really one of those decisions that is, well, where are you versus the people on your team? How much do you know about how this organization works versus the people that you're leading? So how long have they been in there, this organization and how long have you been there? Um, and I have seen it work very, very well indeed, where somebody says, well, I'm fresh into this company. I've never been here before. All of you have been here exact 10 years or more. You tell me how it should be organized. I'll hold you to it. You know, we will decide the process and the organization between us, and I will hold you to it, but you tell me how we should do it. And so if, you know, it, it really is a case of where are you on that, on that plot? And the knowledge that we're talking about in this case, and your relative expertise, is the knowledge of the organization that you're working within. OK, so let's have one more question. Thank you. Um, how, so with that leadership styles, how do you reconcile that with the need to train, say, somebody who needs to uh, improve their skills in specific areas? Thinking in terms of like if you've been at the company, say, 20 years, you don't want to be the guy feeling all, like all the shit because you just happen to be all the expert in every area. So, how, like, how do you make push those that decision making down so that that other people can develop that skill? Yeah, excellent question. This is a cracking example for me of where shifting too far along that sweet spot won't work. If if you've got people who are used to being told what to do by somebody who is more expert than them. And that's the way in which they've always worked. If you suddenly move to the other end of the scale and you say, right, from now on, I'm doing nothing, it's all up to you, it will collapse. It will be so far from what they're used to that they won't, very rarely, are they going to be able to cope. And so this, for me, is an example of where you move down that scale one notch at a time. So if you're starting from a point where you've got a team who is used to just being told what to do, you move them to a point where you're asking them what they would like to do, but you're still making the call. And once you've got them comfortable with that, you move to the next one down. So as long as you move gradually down that scale, I've seen it work. I've seen it fail spectacularly when you try and leapfrog from one end to the other. And two more questions, I think. <laughs> so um, going back to the fights be uh, amongst the teams, what if it's more passive? So I <laughs> manage a team where my developers are, I'm, I myself is a software engineer, but some of the engineers on my team, they have had 25 years of experience, and they're very, very good. And they get job done quickly, um, efficiently. And some of the other team members um, are recent, like five plus years of experience, and they're very, um, you know, very like pep eight and um, they will spend time going through like the old code and making sure, you know, have proper spacing or things like that. How do you manage that? Like how do you, you don't, you want to follow the standards, right? But not also so much that you're losing time. Uh, the code should be readable. It's Python, it's mostly always readable anyway. So how do you um, 
come to that medium and how do you convince your team to um, work in that medium? Well, I think there are, there, there are two separate issues there. There's, there's firstly, how do you deal with the fact that you have some people that are far more experienced than others and slightly less tolerant of those with less experience? And that's, that's one problem to deal with. The second one is where that's reached a point where they are fighting against one another. And you've got to fight to deal Not with it. Not yet. So, uh, so <laughs> always best to get it sorted before we reach the fight. Um, I, I often come back to this diagram because one of the questions I, I, when I say I go around this diagram, and one of the questions I want answered is how, do, how well do I trust the process by which I'm getting information? So, am I, for example, only hearing one side of this argument because this individual takes the time to come and bother me every hour on the hour and I, I am absolutely fully versed in everything that they think about every subject on the face of the planet, but actually I don't know anything about the other side of the argument. So the very first thing for me when I, when I hear this sort of thing going on is I must be confident that I understand both sides of this argument or fight before I make a single move. Um, and then you're really, into some, you're really into dealing with them in the same way as dealing with the resentment. Can you take some of the more experienced people and persuade them that with that hard-won experience that's so uh, well-valued, they would be of even more value if they could spread that experience to their less experienced colleagues? And if you can find ways of rewarding them each time they do it, Rather than rewarding them for the quality of their code, reward them every time they manage to impart a piece of knowledge that improves the code of someone else. Um, and that can simply be by calling them out on it in a meeting. I'm not talking about bonuses here. It can simply be giving someone a verbal pat on the head, a thank you, um, um, a very simple reward. Um, but all too often, we reward the wrong things. Um, we don't reward. It's like dealing with a child, a small child. You reward the behaviour that you'd like to see, and you ignore the bad behaviour. So, lots of questions means that you have to reiterate the talk in the application, <laughs> and um, it's still in, on Friday. Look at for uh, Friday at two o'clock, I think, in the same room. Uh, one more question. So, uh, by the way, just, just to answer yours as well, but the, pe the, the PEP 8, if people are complaining about, the, about that sort of things in code reviews, I used YAP for code formatting, no more. Um, the question for you, uh, one-to-ones, what's your style? Do you do, like, uh, what's the, how's it going, the status of the project? Do you do, like, more personal level? Depends. It really depends on the organization that I'm in, to be perfectly honest, you know, because some organizations will insist that these things are done in a certain way at a certain frequency, and if that's the case, there's no point fighting it. You've just got to go with it. Um, personally, I think these things are far better done. Um, I can't, you know the slide that said we value interactions between people over processes? Well, I think this is a cracking example. If there is a process that says you will sit down at 9.30 on a Friday morning and have a discussion and here is the agenda that we use every week, well, I think there's a better way of doing that. And the better way of doing that is to make sure that you are speaking to your team regularly. Now, different people will have a different idea of what sufficiently regularly means to them. And you can get it wrong in both directions, but it's only by trying it You'll very quickly realise if you're irritating someone because you're making them speak to you too often. And you'll very quickly realise that you're irritating someone because they're not getting as much attention as this person over here. And I think, for me, you have to find that level, that correct level, with each individual member of your team and try to hit it. Uh, and I think that works far better if you're able to do that within the organisation that you're in. Okay, I think it's time to thank our uh, speaker. I think we should do it twice.